Welcome to this session, a practical guide for building 3D web apps with 2D data. Um, before I introduce myself and my co-presenter, I just wanna get a feel for who you guys are and what you've done. So um, can you raise your hand if you've built a 3D app before? Okay, and um, have you done so with, do you, do you have 3D data sources in your organization? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, so if a little fewer than the first group. And how many of you have not built a web app at all? Okay, a couple. And has anyone not used the Java, ArcGIS API for JavaScript for X? Okay. Thank you. So this session is all about helping you guys get started with 3D web apps. Even if you've built them before, some of you have, um, hopefully it gives you a little bit of inspiration of other things you can do with your data. I know when I was first introduced to 3D, I found it a little intimidating, um, looking at scene layers um, and knowing that I didn't have that data available to me, I just thought, I'm not gonna be able to ever use this right now. Uh, the reality is, is you can take the data that you have in your organization right now and build pretty sophisticated 3D web apps. And that's what this session is all about and hopefully you'll leave with a little more confidence and inspiration and you can go back to work or to home and uh, try it out. So my name is Christian Ekinis. I'm a product engineer for the JavaScript API. I live in Redlands, I've been at Esri for four years. I focus specifically on data visualization with the API, smart mapping, and also arcade integration. Um, I'm presenting with Raluca. So hi everyone, I'm uh, Raluca. I'm also a product engineer on the JS API, but on the 3D side, uh, we work from the Zurich office in Switzerland and I mainly work on documentation, samples, blog posts, so basically the 3D version of Christian's job. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun working with Reluca. We, we interact quite a bit, and um, if you have social media accounts like Twitter, you can follow us there, and we're tweeting out the stuff we work on, and we both blog um, on the ArcGIS blog, so I encourage you to follow those and read them as well. So. Now that you know um, what the session is about, uh, I'm gonna go over what you're gonna actually see. Um, basically, you're gonna learn three basic topics or three very common uh, use cases when it comes to 2D data in a 3D scene. Um, and we're gonna introduce that in a series of apps. So first off, um, you may have points that have Z values in attributes, but you don't have an actual uh, 3D point geometry, if that makes sense. But you wanna be able to place that in Z space using an attribute, so we're gonna show you how to do that. Another one is taking advantage of 3D models that are available to you in the API or through open sources um, that you don't need to have any 3D data for. You might have just 2D points, and we're gonna show you how to bring those models into a scene and scale them to real world sizes. And the other thing is extrusion. This one comes up all the time. You might have building footprints or some other polygon data and you wanna extrude it by a value. And we're gonna do that through um, different apps. So Reluc is gonna show you how to create a city visualization using polygon extrusion and web styles. So this includes the buildings and also things like trees and other objects. Um, I'm gonna take you, uh, kinda dive into a different app um, with scientific data so um, the, I, I'm excited about this one because it's not demographics. We tend to do a lot of demographic mapping, but when there's good scientific data out there and you can do different things, we'll, uh, it, it's fun to explore. And so I'll show you how I created this data exploration app in 3D. And then we're gonna go through a series of other examples. It could be underground visualization, um, other uh, nature type visualizations, hiking trails, but also some whimsical type of visualizations and also um, other abstract 3D visuals. Um, and so that's the breakdown. I'm gonna start with Reluca, and then we'll go into the scientific data viz following that. So Reluca. All right, thank you, Christian. So um, 
first of all, um, what I'm going to show you is how to build a 3D city visualization when you only have 2D data. And for me, my motivation was like, I originally come from Romania, so um, we, we, I mean, I couldn't get publicly through to the open data in 3D that we might have. I don't know if we have, but um, the idea is even if I don't have that 3D data, I can still build a 3D visualization of the cities in Romania, and I wanted to show you guys how to do that. Um, I used OpenStreetMap data for that. Uh, another, another option is to, so, some cities have open data portals, like for example, the city of Paris. And I took the data for building footprints from, for the city of Paris and where they also have information about height and I built a second app uh, where I map the height of the buildings uh, on the extruded polygons and I'm going to show you that one too. So basically it's going to be uh, two in one, let's put it this way. So first of all, resources, as I said, uh, for Romania, I used OpenStreetMap. I took the building footprints from OSM and also tree, uh, tree data. So they have actually the mapped trees as points. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, then uh, for Paris, uh, I went to the open data portal. Uh, I'm going to show it to you in a bit. And I downloaded the building footprints there. And then Esri provides a series of base maps and uh, the, an elevation service for the whole world that you can uh, access and then you have access also to um, elevation data. And last but not least, we're going to look a bit into web styles which are um, provide you symbols in 2D but also in 3D you have 3D models that you can use in your data and we, we publish them as web styles and they're there for you to use out of the box. So how can I make a 3D visualization when I have only building footprints? You can extrude the footprints, and this would be the piece of code that allows you to do that. If you have a feature layer with uh, 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 polygons, like building footprints as polygons, you can apply this renderer. Uh, let's say you don't have information about the height of the buildings. Here I'm setting the size of 10. It will be automatically interpreted as 10 meters and I'm applying a color and then all your buildings will have the same height, but um, it will look like it's a 3D visualization. Then let's say you go a step further, like I did with the Paris data, and you actually have information about the height, then you can set up the render so that uh, it takes the color from the symbol, but the size is defined by visual variables. So the, the height of the, of the extrusion is defined by visual variables, and then you can, there you can pass in the field. Um, in my case, the field name is height, and uh, you can pass in a value unit depending on how your data has information. Um, maybe it's in meters, maybe it's in fit, feet, and uh, it, we will automatically map the extrusion height to the uh, field uh, to the information in the field. Um, about the 3D models, the web style symbols that I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a bunch of symbols that we make available for, me, for you. I want to show you our website. So this is the um, API JavaScript page. This is how it looks like when you uh, access it. And then you can go to guide and reference and Esri web style symbols. And here we have a list of all the symbols that we make available for you as web styles. So we have icons and 3D symbols for different, from different categories like uh, street furniture or thematic vegetation or what I used in my app oh, or transportation. Or in my app I used uh, vegetation like realistic trees. And to add them in your app, uh, you just need to set this symbol um, on your renderer. So for example, here I have a simple renderer. I render all the trees the same and I'm setting this web style symbol on my symbol. And that's how you can actually just, you don't need to publish any 3D models. Uh, you can choose from this gallery. I'll show you in a bit what it looks like in my app. And then if you 
this is new and uh, it's uh, going to uh, be in the upcoming release now in three weeks. You can also, maybe you, you have models in a GLTF format. So as I said, for me, I usually go to websites that provide these for free and I, I download them from there and then you can just pass it in as a reference into your, your symbol layer. It has to be an object uh, symbol layer on a 3D point and you can pass it in like this and then you'll get your 3D model. So examples of websites where you can um, find such models are Sketchfab is one of them. Uh, this is the one I showed in the, in the plenary and you can search here for, for example, for tree. And some cost, but some are free of cost. You can click here on downloadable and then you'll get, you'll get the models. Like this could be, for example, a possible model that you could import as a, as a GLTF. Loading. I just want to load this model so that you guys can see it, but it seems like the internet is not cooperating. <laughs> All right, there we go. So you could download this model simply, and then um, then you all you need to do is to pass it in the uh, to pass the link to to the URL to uh, your to where you stored it, and then we will display it for you. And with that, I would like to show you my app. So the first one, I'm going to show you the uh, visualization for Romania. So what I did is I went to, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, Geofabric is like, they have all the OSM data and they store it also in shapefiles. And for me, I really wanted to download the whole country with uh, the building. So I just went here and I went to Romania and downloaded them all. I publish them as a feature service uh, because it's quite a heavy data set, so you need to have a feature service for that. And once I have my feature service, I, uh, uh, I've set up a feature layer where I pass in the URL and then I just set the renderer exactly as I showed you in the presentation. And then I'm adding this layer to my map. Uh, for the trees, same thing, published it as a feature service and passed in the renderer with my web style. I just choose, chose one of the three, trees from the web style and then I'm adding it to my map. And I've also added a search widget because I wanna be able to search for cities. Like I was really curious afterwards to see which cities are actually mapped and um, all right, let's look at the app. So this is what the app looks like. This is Bucharest and you can see like the trees they, one improvement that we did to the trees is that they have several levels of detail. So you can see the ones that are closer to the camera, actually more details than the ones further in the back. And because I did not have height information for the buildings, the buildings all have the same height, which is not really correct, but it still makes for a nice visualization. And it's a bit of a proof of concept. Let's see how this would work out. Um, I can now zoom in to a city that is at the seaside. It's like my favorite city after the, uh, after Bucharest where I was born. And then here the buildings should come up in a minute as well. Uh, we have no trees though here. I, I discovered trees were only mapped in Bucharest, which is the capital. <laughs> So this is one, one way to visualize uh, 2D data. Another one, as I said, you can go and find data on open portals. So by now, I guess most of the big cities have uh, open data portals. So you can just search for open data and the name of the city and figure out if you find something. Um, I searched for Paris, I actually cheated. I saw another visualization that used this data and I thought, okay, they must have it. <laughs> so um, I found the data and it's, it's uh, polygons, I think about, uh, I don't remember exactly how many, but it was a pretty large data set. And then I published it again as a feature service, but this time I had information for the uh, I had information for the period, the construction period when they were built, and I mapped that uh, on the color, and I also had information about the size, 
So I built basically a unique value render based on the period, and I'm passing in here the color for each period, and then I'm passing in as a visual variable the height of the extrusion, uh, and I have the field here, uh, the medium height uh, that I'm using to, to, to set how much to extrude the buildings. And then I'm applying the render, I'm also setting some pop-ups here, and I, I did a little trick because I want to be able to see how many, uh, like to get the patterns, let's say, where is the old town, where's the old city. Uh, when, I, when I look at the whole city of Paris, so I built a tile layer with the exact same symbology that I, would, I could look at from, uh, from, from above. And then when I zoom in, I'm setting a scale here on the feature layer because when I zoom in, I want my feature layer with the extruded buildings to pop up. So now enough of code, let's have a look at the app. All right, here's my, here's my tile layer loading in. And as I said, I wanted to uh, be able to see like where are the old buildings and so on. And for this, I think 2D is awesome. Like it's fast and you can get a, a quick overview of it. But then when I zoom in, I want to have that 3D effect and have um, the shadows and uh, be able then to tilt and go and look at the buildings in, in, uh, in a 3D view. And again, as I said, all you need for this is uh, building footprints. All right, um, I also wrote a blog post about this. So if you guys are interested, uh, Stefan and I wrote a blog post, which is a bit of technical part, like how does it work to load all these uh, features? And then I explained how I built this, uh, these two apps that I just showed you right now. So feel free to uh, go and read it. It's, it will be linked in the presentation at the end. And with this, I will pass it on to Christian for another awesome demo. Okay, so Reluca showed you how to bring in the web style symbols as 3D models, um, which is awesome and cool, but she didn't show you how you could scale those models uh, based on your data. So that's what I'm going to show you with a sample that actually you can find in our SDK. So can everyone see this sample okay? There's green dots on the map. And where's my cursor? Can't even see it. There we go. Um, so this is just a simple point data set of trees around a college campus. Uh, tree data, very common. I see it all the time. It's, it's a common project for uh, students. It's also a common thing for cities, um, as you can see with Reluca's demo. Um, this is actually pretty cool data. It's got different uh, attributes for like the, the species of the tree, but also the size and whatnot. So just visualizing like this in a 2D view is um, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm just creating a map view. So this is a 2D app. And then I bring in my trees layer using this feature service. And then I add that to the map and I'm setting a simple renderer. The simple renderer, all that's doing is just setting, where is that code? There it is. All it's, it's just setting a single symbol, that green dot, um, to all of the trees. But you can do more with their data with, through visual variables. So Reluca showed how you could add, a, use extrusion with the visual variables. You can actually also do that in 2D. So. I have a field here that shows the width or the diameter of the tree canopy. And so I can say, I know that the width is in feet. So you set a value unit and um, you can say that it's the diameter or maybe it's the radius um, and through the value representation property. If you're familiar with how we do renders in, in the JavaScript API already, you'll notice that this is a different kind of visual variable. It's not a typical color visual variables such as this one where we set stops and values where you have a, a low, a min value and then a, a color or size associated with it and then a max. This is when we use real world size, that's, that's all we're doing is, is just taking the value and saying this is a real unit and so we can go ahead and apply that. So we add that as a visual variable and if I refresh, 
you'll see that these uh, canopies are not thematic sizes per se, they're not pixel sizes, they actually re um, maintain their size as they are in the real world. So they don't scale um, like you would see with a typical uh, graduated symbol um, visualization. So it's kind of cool, but this session's all about 3D, right? Something that's nice about our API is that it's pretty uh, consistent between 2D and 3D, so I can go ahead and swap out my map view for a scene view. And let's go ahead and make this visualization a little more interesting. Let's look at carbon storage by adding color here to the visual variables. And so this visual variable, I'm just looking at this carbon storage field and then saying if the tree has zero, then I'm gonna give it this really pale yellow color and if it's got a value of 8,000, um, then it's green. Anything up higher than that will be that. So this should load a 3D scene because I switched to a scene view and now you see a nicer visualization. But we also have the 3D symbols at our disposal. So what can we do? Raluca showed you the web style page. This is in our guide. Um, there's this vegetation section. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a tree and, and map that. So this is basically what she showed was a, a tree symbol in the city and they're all the same size. But how do I get these to scale according to their actual height? And not only do I have a height variable, I also have a diameter from east to west, diameter from north to south, very detailed data. I can actually use all of that to scale these trees. So if I go to this app, again, I have a scene view, and then I can create a series of visual variables. Here I have the tree height, it's just mapped to the height axis. So when we talk about size in 3D, it's not just, uh, it's very different from 2D as you know. In 2D you basically use points or pixels or screen units to define your size. In 3D we're gonna deal with real world units all the time. And not only that, um, but we also deal with this concept of, of the axis. And when we talk about object symbols like points, uh, you, can, you can change the size based on three different axes. One is height, another is width, and the other is depth. So you can think about it kind of like a football. A football has a certain length. You can think about that as the height, and then um, the width and the depth are probably gonna be about the same. And so, I know my data is in feet, so I'm just gonna map the height field to the height axis. Same with the width. There's a width to east to west. And then depth is width from north to south. And then I have that same carbon storage variable available to me. So here's the render with this uh, web style symbol that, uh, that Raluca showed. I just need to add those visual variables to the renderer. So I go height. Oh, tree height, okay. Tree depth, tree height, and tree width. So this is gonna give me something more realistic. It doesn't look like a tree farm anymore when it comes in. You see the trees sized exactly how they look in the real world. So you see this one's a little fatter and shorter, this one's tall and skinny, there's some that are larger. Obviously, these trees are not gonna be all the same species. You could actually bring in different model. We have dozens of tree species, so you could create a unique value renderer to match those species with different values. Um, but I didn't wanna do that. I wanted to show carbon storage still, so I'm gonna add that color visual variable. So this is a unique case where we have four visual variables in the same renderer. I don't wanna use that colored texture, I'm just gonna use this generic other symbol that we have available. It's a, basically a gray tree, and that allows me to apply color on top of it. So I can create a nice looking 3D visualization like this. And you can you know, set up a pop-up to give you different uh, uh, data to the user, like what the condition, excellent, good. So that's basically how you can take a 3D model that you don't own, you don't have, it's, it's just given to you in the API, or you could take a GLTF model that Raluca said, use it the exact same way and you can scale it in the exact same API. So in the plenary session, 
you saw this earthquake visualization from Jan. Uh, this is a GeoJSON layer. This will be released in three weeks in the JavaScript API. Um, it's a live feed from the USGS. Now, they provide uh, all sorts of data attributes for this, but when you just place it in your app, it's by default, these icons are going to be uh, draped on top of your imagery or on top of your, your elevation surface. But if you want to get a sense for what the depth of the earthquake is, you can do that with another property of the feature layer. So this is not handled in a visual variable. It's not handled in a renderer. This is part of the elevation info property of the layer. This allows you to replace or modify a Z value. So what, even if your data does have Z values, you can take advantage of this to offset or to just replace it altogether. In this particular case, the USGS does provide a Z value. The problem with their data though is that they give you the depth in positive units, which makes sense when you say depth, it implies that it's underground. So you say, oh, this, this earthquake occurred 10 kilometers underground. Um, but when you're talking about mapping this in a view, it's gonna place that above the surface. And so we can use this arcade expression, you pass it to the expression property of this feature expression info object, and we're just gonna multiply that z by negative one. And we need to set this unit to kilometers, otherwise it'll default to meters and it'll give you an incorrect visual. So if I apply that, you no longer see them draped on the surface. So we can modify the opacity of this ground to see how they render underneath the surface. So if I go ahead and navigate down there, you can see exactly how they are um, positioned relative to one another. And you could even um, apply thematic visual variables such as these color ones, very similar to the carbon, um, but uh, storage with the trees, but this time with uh, magnitude and you can get um, this more whimsical like beach ball type <laughs> visualization for the earthquakes. And of course you can interact with them and, and learn more details about it. So the main takeaway here is this property. If you have an attribute, you don't have to reference this geometry. You can just use the arcade expression and refer to the attributes. If you do not know what arcade is, or you've never used it before, I strongly encourage you to attend the arcade session um, in the afternoon, um, I believe it's at 2 p.m. Mohan and I are giving it, and we're gonna talk about all things arcade in the JavaScript API. And so this is just the client-side expression language that allows us to reset the Z value. And so that is what's gonna lead me to this scientific visualization or this marine data analysis. Um, I got interested in this a couple of years ago when um, I was asked to present at the uh, American Geophysical Union fall meeting. Um, and uh, I, I saw that Esri had just published this data called uh, ecological marine units. The concept of each ecological marine units is um, Esri collected data in conjunction with many other organizations and scientists and published open data on ArcGIS Online uh, for that referred to all of the uh, different attributes for the world's oceans. And they did so in, in this grid-like manner. Um, so, where's my mouse? I keep losing it. Uh, okay, there we go. And so, they, they did a raster analysis, but then converted them to points. And there's different depths associated with them. So here, what I'm looking at is salinity, but there's also something on the order of eight other attributes, apparent oxygen, dissolved oxygen, nitrate, phosphate. And so I thought, why not take this into a map, a 2D map and explore it? The problem is, is that it's really hard to see. So if I add this slider here to, to show the depth, it's kind of cool to see how it changes the data. I'm just applying a client side filter to achieve this, but it's also hard to see what's actually going on with this data. So if I wanted to apply some kind of relationship visualization um, to, um, to maybe explore the relationship between two variables, for example, salinity and nitrate, um, I can use this cube. This was, a, this was released also last year 
where one variable in this case, salinity, is goes from this white to blue ramp, and then nitrate goes from white to orange. And then if those two variables agree, then it's like this light to brown. And so you can see where those variables agree and where they don't. So as I change my depth, you can see um, the visualization change. It's kind of a cool visual, but it's also hard to understand. So I brought it into his 3D view, and I used that same feature expression info and arcade expression, and I placed each of those points where they actually belong in 3D space. Now, there wasn't any Z values associated with this. There was just an attribute, and I'll show you more about where that came from. But it's a pretty cool app where you can go through and, let's see here, you can you know mess with the visualization, explore it a little bit, and th these are, you're seeing patterns in the Z space that you wouldn't otherwise see because we have it in 3D. In the 2D visual, when I was moving the slider, I couldn't see, I couldn't see the changes on the X, Y axis and the Z axis. So that's pretty cool. And you can also take advantage of things like, like the 3D symbols. So I know through, uh, by reading the paper on this, the, the actual width of the cylinders that they um, collected data for. And so you can create the cylinders and um, using the, the each axis, and then you can explore the data. I mean, the raw data, it's hard to interpret, but that's why having these nice visualization styles is pretty cool to play with. So I can go ahead and do that same visual with nitrate and salinity. And again, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a marine biologist or anything, so I don't know um, if these, uh, if it even makes sense to compare these variables, but as someone who's interested in visualization, I find it fascinating and kind of cool to see different patterns. So you can open up the legend and then um, interact with it. I also added the slice tool so you could um, cut into the data to visualize it um, this way. So pretty cool. So what's going on here? When I did the first visual with just the icons, I'm setting that elevation info object like I showed in the previous slide, but notice that this time I'm no longer referring to the features geometry. There's this unit top attribute. Basically that's just saying, we map, we're mapping cylinders here conceptually. This is what the top elevation is of that cylinder. And so, think of each of these points as having that elevation stored there. So this top one is zero and down here would be 100. And note that they all have different um, depths. It's not necessarily all equal. But when you bring in the cylinders, um, because they have different depths, I need to make sure and set this size visual variable. So in this case, I'm using the thickness, uh, this thickness attribute, so it will tell me how deep this particular point represents um, this observation. And you'll notice that the second visual variable, it's really, uh, it's really bare bones. It just says use symbol value and the axis to apply that to. So I'm applying that depth to just the height because that's what makes sense. But then with the other uh, axes, I'm just gonna refer to the width because those are gonna be constant across the board. I don't need to set those separately. You also note this exaggeration variable I have. So if I open up my code, um, let's see here. Maybe I don't have it. Oh, I think it's down here actually. Yeah. I have this exaggeration. So um, I'm actually using a bathymetry layer to uh, show the elevation um, with, uh, for the ocean surface. And in order to get a good looking visual, I do a little bit of exaggeration. And sometimes when you're doing these 3D views, it's, it's pretty necessary to, to add exaggeration, otherwise it's hard to see data. Um, and I'll show you kind of how that works um, for a sec. So if I just set the exaggeration to one, and then refresh, you'll see that I get, this is what it would look like in the real world to scale. Um, it's very thin, hard to, uh, 
hard to see what's going on. So that's why I added an exaggeration. And of course you could uh, make it even larger. Oops, I gotta save that. And uh, you'll get something that looks a lot more exaggerated and maybe less useful. So how am I applying that to, you saw kind of in the snippets how I did that with the visual variables. I'm just using the arcade expression and multiplying that value by that exaggeration. Um, but when it comes to the bathymetry layer, I have this, this custom module I created using this bathymetry layer that Esri provides for free. And I'm loading that elevation layer and when I fetch the tile, I'm just, I'm just multiplying the exaggerate, I'm just multiplying that exaggeration value by the elevation value for each, uh, for each grid cell. And so that's how you can achieve that. And so I use that same constant throughout the app. And I just wanted to point out that so a lot of all these concepts that we've been discussing so far are in the documentation. So if I go, um, to the documentation pages. You can see in the API reference, we heavily document the 3D symbols and how they work. But not only that, you get um, the, the code as well. So um, if I search for trees, you can see both of those tree samples that I demonstrated. And we explain, we give a few details on, on how we built the app and, and how it works. Um, and also there was, I think if you search for web style symbol, you'll get other applications such as this realistic uh, city scene using cars and trees, mailboxes, even garbage cans and things like that are brought in if this data will load. So you get this, what is this, a newspaper stand? And they're, they're pretty highly detailed. Um, like you can even like read the print on some of these things, which is pretty fascinating. Um, anyway. Back to me. Thank you. All right, so um, this is an app that I actually demoed last year, but I just thought I will mention it a little bit to you guys here, because maybe you haven't been here last year. Um, I want to show you a hiking app that I built entirely based on 2D data. So I had the hiking trails from the Swiss National Park uh, as lines without set values. And then I used the base map is uh, created by, I think, the content team at Esri. So um, I just re reused the base map that they created. And then um, elevation data is provided also as an elevation layer. I, I don't know how many of you know this, but if you set the ground here in your map uh, to world elevation, then we have a world elevation service that is available for you and that will um, uh, be loaded in your scene. So that's what I actually used here to have for this terrain. Um, a thing that I did was to actually create an elevation profile based on this. And uh, what I want to show you right now is how I did this. Um, basically, for each of these uh, trails, uh, I have the option to use a query elevation method that will uh, bring back the trail, like, that will return the, the, the line uh, enriched with set values. And the code to do that is uh, over here. So I have my elevation layer, which is uh, using the world elevation service provided by Esri. I use query elevation, I call the query elevation method. I pass in the geometry that doesn't have um, set values. Um, you can optionally set the resolution that you will want your uh, set values to be sampled at. And I set it to finest contiguous because I really want to have uh, the most detailed that is available in the data. And then in the response, you have a geometry that this time has set values, and I use that uh, uh, geometry afterwards to generate the elevation profiles. So basically, your friend over here is this query elevation method, um, either on the elevation layer or on the ground, where you pass in the geometry and you can pass in some options, and from it you will get back uh, the values with uh, the geometry with set values. I find this um, 
pretty helpful. Like if somebody comes and says, yeah, but I don't have elevation data, you don't need to have, unless you need like extremely precise and detailed elevation values, you can always go and uh, use this um, elevation service that we provide for you. All right, and now I have two more, let's say, funny examples. Uh, I had fun building this uh, terrain visualization using contour lines. So uh, what I did was to generate the contour lines from um, elevation data, and then I built this, I published it as a polygon feature layer, and then I applied a renderer just the way I showed you before with extruded polygon. So I extrude them um, based on a, a static size. So I just uh, give a size there and I call, I use visual variable on the color uh, based on the value of the contour lines. And I'm going to show you the, uh, oh, actually I could do it here. I'm going to show you the final result. It's more like uh, an artistic thing, I would say, but it's just for fun <laughs> a little bit. So this is the island of Malta, and it looks something like this in 3D. You see it all quite often in 2D, and I thought this looks like a 3D visualization to me, so then I just went ahead and uh, built it. My computer is a bit slow. And then another thing that I did for fun was to create a low poly map of Switzerland. It's not yet official. I will uh, create a blog post about it on how I built it. This is probably the kind of map that you will build once you're like, whoa, 3D is so cool. I want to learn all about it. And then um, to actually create this, all I needed was a border, a, a geojson of, with the border of Switzerland, and then the points that I used for interpolation within it. And again, what I used is this query elevation to actually get the elevation data and to be able to um, triangulate the points and create this mesh geometry. And then I also applied the colors based on the elevation. And then these models that you see here, um, they're from different websites. Um, I downloaded them and um, made sure that they're under Creative Commons and that I can use them. And then I loaded them as GLTF uh, with our new importer. Um, so basically, the, the raw data for this map is points and polygons and node set values. And I'll be putting up a blog post um, at some point in the future soon <laughs> on how you can create this. And my goal would be like to allow like everyone to create this for his own country by only passing in uh, a few points and the border. All right, so these were some of my fun examples. Um, we have some uh, slides here with the resources, or is there anything that you would like to show, Christian, before I? Yes, just one other okay. thing. Okay, spontaneously. Yes. Switched over to you. So um, for those of you who are, um, kind of more hardcore with <laughs> your uh, programming skills, you can do a couple of, let's see here. There's a couple of uh, things available to you. Like we extend the WebGL engine. Oh, that's the wrong sample. Oh, there we go. So you can extend the WebGL engine and create more sophisticated visualizations as well. Um, this is just pulling from a feed of the International Space Station. This is bringing in a model from 3JS, and then um, we're animating the position and the and who can see the space station at that moment within that circle, and that's all done by extending the the WebGL engine. Um, I don't know if I got this other one. Same here. This is actually these windmills outside of Palm Springs. If you look very closely you'll see the blades of these, of these windmills spinning. And that's using actual wind data that's current to today, and it's spinning those blades based on the wind data. And um, so if you uh, are familiar with WebGL, um, you, I encourage you to look at those samples and maybe dabble with them a little bit, and you can get inspiration um, for building 
these uh, more sophisticated 3D applications using a 2D data source. Same thing with these windmills. These are models that were um, brought in um, or rendered with WebGL, and they're also scaled using attributes from the feature layer that this data comes from. I also wanted to point out with the um, with the the ocean app that I showed um, that that's a lot of data that's coming into the scene view. So it may not be um, uh, very performant to bring in that much data, and it's not necessarily the best idea to bring in points like that and to try to create a rendering um, that I did. What would be more uh, would be a better approach is to do, use vol volumetric symbology, which is something that we're researching and working on. Um, it's just not there yet. And also I wanted to point out that even though that it may not perform very well, it's still cool to, to play with and to try. So don't let that discourage you. All right, so uh, you already have a slide with the resources. Um, Christian wrote a night, so of course the JavaScript um, SDK, so the documentation is always there for you to uh, search through the samples and discover what you can build with our API. Then Christian wrote a super nice uh, ArcUser article exactly about this topic on how to go and create 3D visualizations with 2D data. And then my, I linked to my blog post where I talk about how I built the city visualizations that I showed you in the beginning. And these are just um, links to our apps if you wanna check them out. And before we go into question time, I just want to ask you to fill up the survey. <laughs> All right, that was it. Uh, thank you for your attention and we're ready to take questions now. Yes. Oh, sure, yeah. And um, while we're waiting on questions too, I wanna uh, encourage you to attend, if you're not familiar, if we're, you're looking at that render code and the symbols and you're like, I'm not really familiar with that, Raluca and I will be presenting on 3D visualization at four o'clock. That's in Primrose C and D, just around the corner here. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go there. And also with Arcade, if you heard Arcade mentioned a couple of times and um, want to learn more or you want to see what's new, then come and listen to that talk at three o'clock as well. So any other questions? Yes. As we're experimenting with WebAssembly at all? Yes. Um, the question is, is Esri experimenting with WebAssembly? The answer is yes, and we're already using it. Um, we're using it in um, a couple of places. One is with our projection engine. Um, I'm not sure about the 3D view, because we're, we're not doing it, we're doing projection in 2D with WebAssembly. Um, you know. I'm not sure, so we actually, we use your projection engine, right? We didn't build anything custom in 3D. Okay, yeah, what, so. What we experimented with, but was more on the procedural uh, rules of generating cities, so we're trying to see how to bring that to the web, and ArcGIS Urban is using, but it, we're not exposing it yet, and it's not part of the API. So your answer is like um, more focused on the API. <laughs> yeah, and, and we are looking at it for other projects as well. Like documentation regarding um, what we're doing with WebAssembly. It, there is a little bit on the projection uh, engine, so it's not. Let's see here if I can. Where did my thing go? There we go. If we go to the documentation here. We just, I mean, it's not, it's not super detailed, it's more of a mention, like the browser must support WebAssembly, because unfortunately we still support IE 11, which does not support WebAssembly. We won't get into that right now, but so not all of these features are gonna work um, across the board. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, are we looking into doing client-side 3D analytics such as view sheds and watersheds? And the answer is 
No, but I mean, we're looking into it, but it's not going to come any. I mean, I don't definitely not this year. I don't want to say too much, but um, it's not going to come this year. But it's definitely on our list of things to work on and hopefully next year. But I don't want to say anything. Yeah, as far as out of the box tooling, it's not obviously not there yet. Um, people have uh, done stuff, though, already using our API. Um, John Grayson from our prototype lab has done view sheds on client side where you hover in the 3D view and you see the view shed and have that high level of interactivity. I believe he's here. I'm not sure. I haven't seen him this week, but he should be in the showcase today. Um, but if you're interested in that, um, I would encourage you to contact him because um, he's implemented that. And, and of course, we are researching that as well. Any other questions? All right, we'll go ahead and close it up. Feel free to come up and ask us if, um, if you have something that comes to mind. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at another session. Thanks. Thank you.